Guess what's happening this weekend? You don't know? Well, we all should know. It's the 75th Women's US Open Golf Tournament. And why is it that it's not all over our feeds and our timeline, just like the Masters was, or like the Men's US Open was? Hmm, well, don't feel bad because I felt really, really guilty that I was unaware of this until I did a podcast last week about the 75th Women's US Open. Get right to our guests. Beth Ann Nichols is a senior writer for Golf Week. Beth Ann primarily covers the LPGA and has built a reputation for her knowledge of the women's game. Sophie Walker is a professional, or pardon me, a former professional player on the Ladies European Tour. She teaches golf and she works as a golf analyst for various broadcasts, including Sky Sports. Welcome to the show. I felt so guilty that I'm like, why isn't it all over the place that I decided, you know what? I'm going to do a ton of research this morning to find some fun, cool facts about the tournament that I can share with all of you. And just maybe it might catch somebody's interest to turn on the TV and support women's golf and women's sports. So let's get start. Let's get started with some of the research that I did today. So where is it taking place? It's taking place in Houston, Texas. Tons of family there, and I'm sure no one's aware of it. But here we are, the Champions Golf Club. A fun little fact about the owner of the golf course: he is the oldest Masters champion at the age of 97. And can you believe it? He goes to work every day still at 97. Unbelievable. His name is Jack Burke Jr. So that's very exciting. I hear he still shares a locker at, uh, at Augusta National with Tiger Woods. He does. Yeah. He told me that he tries to ask him to leave some tip money behind in that locker room. <laughs> <laughs> so far, Tiger has yet to oblige. <laughs> Another thing about the course you might not be aware of that there has been tons of other men's um, opens and PGA championships. There's a Ryder Cup there. There are tons of men's and USGA tournaments at that golf course, but it's the first time in 30 years that a, uh, a women's US Open has gone back to Texas. So I'm sure all the Texans are extremely excited about that. And speaking about Texans, in the pool of women that are playing, it's 156 total. Seven of them are from Texas. So some are saying that to win the Open, the advantage would be people that are used to playing on Bermuda grass. So there's different kinds of grass. And um, the fact that if you are good at lag putting, that would be an advantage to you as well. So a few people are saying that the Texans would have advantage um, at the US Open, but there's actually a few um, LPGA players that have maybe from Korea or somewhere else that have now made Texas their full-time home in the US. So they might have some insight as well on Bermuda grass. Another thing that you need to be aware of about the golf course is that there's two courses that the women will be playing on. One's called the Jackrabbit and the other one's called the Cypress Creek. And you're probably wondering why that's never happened before in 75 years. The reason for that is because now the tournament usually is in May or June and it's been pushed to December. What do we know about December? That it's cold and the sun goes down quite early. So how do we get all these 156 women to play the first two rounds of qualifying? Well, you need to have done two separate golf courses um, so you can get all the women through, right? So that's the reason for it. In the corner, but that's the pressure of the major. It's, mm -hmm. you can't afford, like some, some uh, tournaments, you can afford like a bad round, you know, but at the US Open, you can't even afford like a bad couple of holes. It's yeah. so mentally like draining on you. And you know what? Kudos to the LPGA, kudos to the USGA for making this happen. It's the last tournament of the year and we should all tune in to watch it. And they made it happen. They found a way to do it, which is what I feel like 2020 has been all about, how we all are adapting and adjusting to how it's happening, and they made it happen. So you know what, kudos to you guys, that's unbelievable. So $5.5 million, they're gonna be playing on, on two golf courses. 
um, for their qualifying rounds, which has never been done before, which is very cool. The owner is the oldest living Masters champion, which is exceptionally cool. For a European to win in America, it's a massive deal. Like, I don't know if you appreciate it, but it, over here, it's, it's just, it's an I've arrived. Because everyone goes, oh, right. like, you could in Europe, you can play on open golf courses, Lynx golf courses that you used to. But when you go over there and you need to hit it and you need to carry it further and you need to play out the rough to the tight pins, can you do it? And it's like, now she knows she can do it. So. While we're on the topic here, do you have any thoughts or can you share with us how the U.S. Women's Open is um, perceived or regarded in the U.K.? The U.S. Open has got more significant, I think, for the European players recently is because there's now a qualifying for it over in Europe. So the past handful of years, five, six years, there's now 36 holes qualifying in England, which if you're a European base, it's a lot easier to go and qualify for. So there's a handful of spots for players to go to it. I would put it below the open as like the number two major in our opinion over here. But I mean, a major is a major, right? Like you want to win yeah. one, so yeah. it doesn't really matter which one. So you know, there's it's in Texas. Texas hasn't had it in 30 years. There's seven women that are that are Texans that will be a part of this. Angela Stanford. She isn't the only 43 year old out there. There's also Christy Kerr. I did hear she got hurt with a golf cart accident, but hopefully she gets to play. So just think about them. There's 43 year old women out there playing the game against youngins. So this would be very, very exciting to watch as well as another fun fact that um, like rookies or the first time someone that came into playing the US Open and winning it, there's only been four women that have ever done it. So in their first year, they've won the US Open. Four women did that. And this year there's 41 women who have never been into the US Open and this is their first year. 25% of the young ladies that are going to be playing, it'll be their first time ever in the US Open. So you can imagine nerves, the excitement, COVID throws a whole other plot twist to you. So for the rookies that are out there for their first time ever, um, what kind of advice or what would you, what would be some wisdom that you would drop on them in terms of nerves or just any kind anything you would just leave them with what would you say to them um i don't know like what it's different because obviously the u.s open to it won't, won't be the same as what it normally is do you know what i mean like normally it's just you get your you get your Lexus car. You get like everything. Got, like, <laughs> the presents. It's like it's amazing what you get thrown at you. So like you won't get that, which will actually be a bit of an advantage for a rookie because there's less distractions. Mm. Okay, so like trying to get a practice round is normally a complete nightmare at a US Open, but it's going to be fine now because there's two courses to play and whatever. So it, it's. If you're going to be a rookie, it's actually a really good US Open to be a rookie at because there's a limited amount of fans. There's no expectation on anybody. Like this year in the majors, I mean, it's proven anybody can win one and there's been a lot of first-time winners. <laughs> um, a good dark horse or, or a player to watch. So why don't we start with, uh, put the pressure on you, Beth Ann, and start with you. Who do well, you think? Well, I'm going with the same pick that I've had at uh, previous majors in b park <laughs> yes um I, I i i i mean no one's had a better record in the last decade at the u.s women's open than in b park my dark horse probably won't be that darker horse but she's still not one of major so my, my tip is danielle kang because um well everything what we said before she's all right so mine isn't a dark horse either but i feel like sophie just confirmed a few things that i was thinking <laughs> so mine's emily Pedersen. I think she's just on a high from winning and has that confidence. And if she can just bring that great energy um, to the U S I think it'll be fun to watch. That's for sure. So that would be my choice. In and terms I think of how far she hits it, by the way, just look out. Cause she is the way she's hitting that driver at the minute. It's so straight and it's really quite long. So I think she'll be pushing for like one of the longest off the tee as well. 
anyway carry on Sorry. i love it no that's great um and then you know i have to go for the canadian don't i like you know <laughs> come on <laughs> so that would be my like ultimate choice but yeah those are my two so what do you think are you gonna tune in after all these amazing little nuggets that i've dropped on you and it's the 75th year think about that for women's sports 75 years ago they had their first women's u.s open like just unbelievable with all that we're going through in 2020 think about all the barriers that they had to break and to create a tournament for themselves that they wanted to be a part of and they created it so here i have to look at my notes a little bit but i did some research on that as well because i found that extremely fascinating so in 1946 there was the women's professional golf association the WPGA is what it was called. So they had the US Open under that umbrella for three years. Then in 1950, the LPGA started. Um, so then the next four years under the LPGA branch, they had the US Open. And then in 1953, I believe, um, the USGA took over the uh, US Open under their branch. So in the LPGA, it is one of the top five uh, majors that they have, but it is the biggest in terms of prize money. Well, I hope that was a little educational lesson for you because guess who was crazy Googling this morning? And I hope you get a chance at some point to, you know, just turn on the TV, support the Canadian. If you're from Canada watching this, um, just support women's sports and so Thursday, and you can watch it all the way to Sunday, and on Sunday will be the winner. So if you get any time online, look them up, see who you know, who you're putting your money towards, um, and cheer them on. In the comments below, let me know uh, who your guesses are for maybe top three if you have them, or what country you think will win. Will it be US? Will it be Canada? Will it be somewhere in, in Europe uh, as the winner? Or will it be a Korean? We don't know. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching.